As Catholic homeschoolers, we want our children to develop relationships with the saints as role models and friends. However, not everyone who lived a life of heroic virtue has been formally canonized by the Church, so we might have to dig a little deeper to study their fascinating and inspiring lives. My guest today, the miracle hunter himself, Michael O'Neill, is here to tell us about his new book, They Might Be Saints. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Maladnik, your host, and today I'm discussing a new book that homeschoolers will love called They Might Be Saints by Michael O'Neill. Michael O'Neill is an award-winning author, EWTN television and radio host, and creator of the popular miracle tracking website, MiracleHunter.com. O'Neill, a graduate of Stanford University and member of the Mariological Society of America, has been interviewed about his research numerous times on Catholic and secular media like the History Channel, Nat Geo, NBC Today, and the Dr. Oz Show. He was the consultant for the National Geographic magazine cover story and map about the Virgin Mary, the most powerful woman in the world. O'Neill is the author of numerous books including They Might Be Saints, new this year from EWTN, and the Catholic Media Award-winning Virgin Mother Queen from Ave Maria Press. On EWTN, he is the radio host of the Gabriel Award-winning weekly radio program, The Miracle Hunter. And he's the television host and executive producer of the weekly docu-series, They Might Be Saints, about the lives and intercessory miracles of future American saints, as well as the new travel series, Explore with the Miracle Hunter. And everyone, I have all the air days and times for Michael's radio and TV programs in our show notes, and you can catch up with Michael at his websites. They might be saints.com and miraclehunter.com also in the show notes. Oh my goodness, Michael, if you were any more accomplished, um, we would just spend the whole episode reading about your accomplishments. Uh, this is so much fun to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Thank you. Well, there's a lot, lot of things keeping me busy, but uh, this is my dream job. So I just, uh, I love, I love telling stories about miracles and saints. Praise God. Isn't it wonderful the way God can, and when we say yes, and we just keep saying yes, he does load our plate, but it's a, but it's a good meal. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. So tell us first a little bit about your podcast and your dedication to sharing about the miraculous, because I think that's what you're best known for, at least in my circle. <laughs> So I love uh, every week on EWTN radio, I've got a show that airs on Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time, where every every week we do two interviews, uh, much like this one, a 15-minute conversation, where we talk about, uh, talk to uh, potential authors, people who have received a miracle, uh, such as uh, recently we talked with Father Michael Driscoll, who was the most recent uh, miracle that was uh, used in the uh, Father Titus Brans Bransma canonization cause. So he's from Florida, so we got to hear about his healing miracle, and, and that's one of my favorites, to talk to these people who have valid Vatican-validated miracles. And so um, we also get to talk about some of these very strange and interesting phenomena, such as Marian apparitions, uh, Eucharistic miracles, the stigmata, incorruptible bodies of saints, and healing miracles. So the, the whole panoply of things uh, that in the Catholic Church we have that enrich our faith in such a big way. And so every week I report on the new miracle news happening around the world and the sainthood news and everything all wrapped up into one. So I try to pack it all in, but it's, uh, it's lots of fun for me to be able to, to talk about all these things. Wow. Yeah, that's it's really uh, just that sense of that there are miracles still happening around us. Really appreciate that you're shining a light on that. I feel like that's an encouragement we can all use, especially since we kind of feel like we're in dark times right now. I think so. And, you know, for better or worse, uh, I think that people uh, feel comfortable with me talking about miracles because maybe I'm as much of a uh, skeptic as I am a believer. So I think that uh, perhaps my engineering background uh, that uh, makes me think this way, but 
I really like to be shown the proof of things. I like to know what's real and what's not, what sort of legend and hagiography and those things that are actual miracles that the church has investigated and validated. And so I try to shine a light on things, but give a, a sense of truth to them too, as well. So uh, this is a this is a fun uh, fun pursuit that I have, and I and I hope that it helps uh, some other people and inspires their faith as well. Mm, I really appreciate that you made that point because I feel like we can be so pro miracle that we're not very discerning about what we kind of spread around, and uh, and the truth will set us free. So we don't need to be afraid of that. And investigating and and being just a little skeptical is okay. But but then again, we also want our hearts to be ready for God to move in miraculous ways. That's right. It's uh, I think it's it's the right position to be in, and I think that. When we do talk about something as something we do believe to be miraculous, I think that lends some credibility to it. We have to avoid being overly credulous. And I have given talks. I give talks all around the country to different parishes and conferences and other groups. And I've had people shout at me. They say, Padre Pio's body is incorrupt. Well, no, it's not. Only his heart is incorrupt, for example. He wears a silicone mask and he looks uh, quite incorrupt. But uh, there are people who have very strong opinions about these things who haven't necessarily done all the research. So when I've done the research, I like to be able to share that with people. Mm, yeah, I think that's really important. The church has always very much been kind of a cradle for science, and we want to never never feed into that misconception that somehow the church is anti-science and that we're all of our heads in the proverbial clouds. I, I want to um, make a make a little bit of a hard turn, even though I could easily talk about miracles the whole time. What really drew you to this topic in your new book of Americans who are either canonized or they're on their way, they're on that path? So as much as we want to divert from the topic of miracles, it is the very topic of miracles that got me <laughs> introduced, introduced introduced to these saints, because with every canonization cause, and I detail this in one of the early chapters of my book, there needs to be two miracles that are shown to be through the singular intercession of these would-be saints. And so it is the finding of miracles, normally intercessory healing miracles. Those are things that are uh, serious conditions, not liable to go on in their own. They must be instantaneous, complete, and lasting cures. And there could be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. And it must be the intercession of just one saint. I always pray to a bunch of saints when I need help, but in these cases of intercessory miracles approved by the Vatican, you can only pray to just that one saint and all your friends can only pray to that same saint. So we have uh, 24 Americans who are venerables or blesseds and they are on the path to sainthood and they need miracles in order for Rome to actually fully recognize them as being in the canon of the saints. Oh boy. So would you say, is it the church's stance, and I'm really asking this without knowing the answer, that during this process for canonization, are there more miraculous graces available to us? Uh -huh. That's an interesting question. <laughs> and perhaps uh, that might be a question for when we get to heaven. Uh, we'll uh, quiz God on that <laughs> one. It might be unknowable to us right now, but it seems to me that when we seek the intercession of the saints, God in a special way uh, works his graces, works his power through those saints and allows miracles to happen because we are seeking them out uh, through those intercessors. So it might be something that we don't officially know right now, but I think that the saints provide this uh, great inspiration as lives of holiness, but they also find uh, give us avenues for grace and for miracles. So uh, the saints are very special to us as Catholics. Oh, yeah. And I'm super excited to hear that there are 24 of them and that by studying their lives, we can find out how in our own country, people live lives of heroic virtue and, and give ourselves just a sense of within our own culture that it can be done. <laughs> I think so. And I think these things are a little bit like baseball teams. We kind of cheer for the those uh, teams that are near our, our home. Uh, for example, in Chicago, there are three future saints of Father Augustus Tolton, Mother Maria Kalpas, and Mother Therese Dujic, all from Chicago. So I think Chicagoans might have a special pull towards those three. Or New York, there are a handful of saints. Or California, a few saints. So uh, different places in the United States or different orders of uh, religious may be cheering for their saints more than others. But as Americans, we have a certain sense of Catholic pride or American pride when someone from our own ranks rises to uh, the level of venerable, blessed, or saint in Rome. I love that. That's such a great analogy. Um, so step us into some of the specifics that you've been excited about and written about and, and connect it to our ordinary lives. What can we learn from these people? 
Well, one of the interesting side effects from writing this book, and I included every single venerable and blessed from the United States in this book. So there's 24. So I didn't leave anybody out. And the way that I judged who belonged in the book or who didn't, people who were born in the United States or people who lived the majority of their lives in the United States. So those are the people who made it in. And we have 24 venerables and blessed. So within some years, decades, we're going to have a whole uh, whole slew of new saints. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but when you read the book and I, I wrote all the chapters in order based on when the saints were born all the way to the most recent father Aloysius Schwartz um, you can sort of get a sense of American history because these saints lived amongst us they lived lives as Americans so we can really see what was going on in America at each of those stages as those people lived and died so I think it's pretty exciting to see that there are saints saints for everyone it's not just uh, these priests and nuns the majority of people are priests and nuns who do get elevated to become venerables blesseds and saints but we do have others who uh, who lived regular lives like the rest of us and we find inspiration in, in all of their lives so I I think that you know we we have some big names like Father Patrick Payton, or we have uh, others like Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, or uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen. These are the big names that most practicing Catholics know those names, but I'd be willing to bet that most people don't know twenty of the twenty-four. So it's a pretty uh, pretty good collection. Oh, that's so exciting! It almost feels like they're little Christmas presents, uh, yeah. or or should I say, Easter gifts to to unwrap. <laughs> That's right. And one of the one of the nice things, and especially if people are going to be using it in a homeschool environment or in confirmation classes, is that oftentimes we read something and we wonder, well, what did this person really look like? Or perhaps help me visualize what was going on here. The television series, They Might Be Saints, which airs on Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we've done 15 episodes of these people who have lived these heroic lives. So people could read the book and then watch the television show, or they could watch the television show or read the book to learn more. So those things uh, go hand in hand and in sort of a dovetail kind of way. Oh, I love that you said that because we're such a visual culture. Part of it's because of all the technology, but we do love to look at the faces and see how they dressed and where did they live and everything that we can get our, our eyeballs on, I guess. <laughs> That's right. And it's been a great blessing to do the television show with EWTN and the book just lines up exactly with that and with more detail is the book. And I think that people will see that these are sort of regular people who fought the good fight, who uh, when they got knocked down, they got back up, but uh, that's how they stayed on the path to sainthood. And sainthood isn't for something for, you know, these priests and nuns who lived centuries ago in a far off place like Italy, you know, that uh, that's not for us. We're, we have this universal call to holiness where we're all supposed to be saints. So hopefully these lives of saints can inspire us to see that these are regular people just like us and we can be saints too. So hopefully there's some inspiration to be found in the book. I want to hear the one that you love the most, but I also want to hear which one struck you as being the most ordinary in the sense of living an, an ordinary life. It's so interesting because each of these uh, each of these people, you could say that they are ordinary people living extraordinary lives of heroic virtue, and that's the, from the tagline of the television show. Uh, but you know, when I think of my own life, and I, I write a lot of books, and I do a lot of TV and radio types of work, and I evangelization is kind of my uh, my middle name. And, and in a lot of ways, I'm just trying to get the word out on, on what we believe and helping people to be excited about the faith. But, you know, if I ever feel like I'm doing enough and I can just rest for a moment, I think of uh, Venerable Bishop Berga from Frederick Berga from Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Uh, he's, a, he's a priest who came to us from Slovenia. And what he did, he's known as the snowshoe priest because everywhere he went, he put on these snowshoes and trekked thousands of miles all over Upper Peninsula, Michigan, in order to give the sacraments or spread the gospel or build a church. He was he was so tireless in, in all his years of life, but uh, he covered that entire you know four thousand uh, mi square mile uh, area up there, and it was absolutely amazing his life. So anytime I want to rest, I think of Bishop Berga and all, all that he did. So he did not live an ordinary life, but. Uh, perhaps there are other people uh, like uh, Venerable uh, Pierre Toussaint from New York. He was, uh, he was a hairdresser, believe it or not. He was a businessman and a hairdresser. And he just spent time talking to people as they uh, came in for their haircuts. And that's how he spread the gospel sort of in their ear doing their hair. Uh, so that was kind of an amazing thing. Or we talk about Bishop Alphonse Gallegos. He was called the Bishop of the Barrio in uh, Sacramento and other parts of California. And he was 
was known for just walking the streets and sort of being with the neighborhood kids, even the gang members or the people who were working on their cars. He would just go around and spread the gospel and invite people to church that way. So a very simple, uh, simple thing. He was a bishop, but he really brought the faith to the streets. So uh, all these all these saints lived extraordinary lives, but they were all ordinary in their own ways as well. Wow, I love that. I love to just step into kind of what they did because we can be so curious. A lot of us can, and I've felt, fallen into this myself at times, can think of the saints as having lived lives that are way too hard and over our heads, or they can just seem like we kind of just touched on, just not real, like plaster saints, uh, that maybe it was just so easy for them because they were just that way. You know, I think of Our, Our Lady with her hands outstretched when we see her kind of dispensing graces in so many um, so many images, that yieldedness to God, that that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power that works in them, those images are meant to speak of spiritual realities and yet they were human. So uh, yeah, that's something we struggle with, right? Absolutely. And for all those saints who were uh, very ordinary and who just fought the good fight, we have some saints who lived extraordinary lives like uh, Venerable Augustus Tolton, for example, the first black American priest. He was not accepted by any U.S. seminary, although he had this great calling to be a Catholic priest. There was no such thing as an African-American priest at that time. He had to go to Rome And when they were about to assign him to Africa, they actually said, why don't you come back to your old parish where you were bullied as a child and be the priest there? So he was brought (laughs) right back to the United States and he served in Chicago as well. So an incredibly difficult life or uh, Venerable uh, Cornelia Connolly, who uh, went on to she was a mother whose husband actually went on to become a Catholic priest and left her. And then she ended up being a, a, uh, a, a sister, a nun after that. And it was just such a, com- I mean, that one can be a movie. It's so complicated, but that one's <laughs> in there as well. So we have the whole gamut, these these people who have lived a very simple life and those who have lived the most complicated of lives. And they're all represented in this book, They Might Be Saints. Mm. What are some ways that we can recognize the pathways in our own lives where God is calling us to level up into holiness? Well, I think one of the things that I've learned from this book is that uh, when we talk about how can we look at these lives and say that they are uh, inspirations or how can they be a call to us to live our own lives of holiness? And we might reflect on this idea that maybe or get rid of this idea that these saints were special people who were given special graces and we don't have those same graces. But I think that we do. And I think that what makes these uh, saints or future saints uh, remarkable is they fell down like the rest of us. We all struggle. We all have our, our problems, our issues, our challenges, those things that really bug us, those things that get us, those things that pull us away from God. But the difference with these these people is they got back up after they fell down. So they had their own challenges, their own disappointments, their own failures, but they got back up and they kept their faith in God and uh, that uh, informed how they lived their lives. So I, I really hope that people read this book and find out, yes, these are average people, but they kept on fighting and uh, we're called to do the same. Our holiness can be found in when we pick ourselves up and ask for God's help in uh, getting back at it. So I think uh, I think that's a story that unites all these people, all 24 of these cases. Wow, I love that, that you touched on that because I feel like we can trip over ourselves and our own free will, our own brokenness, and also the brokenness of other people and identify it as being God. Like God doesn't care about me or God is making my life hard. Um, there are other things forces at work here. And yes, he can draw great good out of all of those things, but it takes believing that, that God will draw good out of everything and that he loves us and he's there in the midst of our stumbling and falling flat on our faces, eager to help us up. Absolutely. And I I think these these stories of these 24 venerables and blesseds, uh, you know, I think that can give us some, some insight into these are average people just like us. And, uh, you know, hopefully that seeing the way that they rose up and that they honored God's will, in, even in the most difficult circumstances and never gave up, hopefully that can uh, find, give some inspiration to everyone who picks up the book. 
Yeah, and I feel like we can share that so naturally with our children because when they see us go to confession or apologize when we mess up or we expect them to make amends when they fall, we can put it in the context of, gosh, remember that saint struggled and kept getting back up again, that, that we can integrate it into our family life. Yeah, I think so. And I think that one of the things is that uh, we we look at these saints and we sometimes we have a monolithic view of these saints, but they're, they have, there's such variety in the saints as far as the challenges that they faced or the lives that they lived or the professions that they had. You know, there's, there's such variety in these and people can find a connection in all of these. I keep giving this book out for Christmas. Now that's my, it's my book. So I'm motivated to give it out to it, to my friends, but I keep tagging chapters in these books because I give it out and I say, this saint has some, reminds me a little bit of you or this saint, uh, you might connect with them in a special way. So I direct people uh, to individual chapters of the book that they might read them and uh, and see uh, some inspiration in that particular saint. So that's uh, that's one thing I've been trying to draw some connections on. Oh, I love that. And it makes me think when you identify with a particular saint um, and identify that with another person, not only is it you making it more real for yourself, but you're helping that other person too to say, oh, whoa, you saw that in me? That's right. That's right. And one of my one of my goals in doing the program, They Might Be Saints on EWTN and writing the book, They Might Be Saints, is that I actually hope that some of these people who might be saints end up becoming saints as well. So at the end of every program, when you watch it, there's the intercessory prayer and a place you can contact the causes for more information. And if you have a miracle, and the book is the same, that is, if you read a chapter, if you really connected with a particular saint and began to pray to them, I include the little prayer at the end of the chapter and the place where you can report your miracles and favors to. So if you have uh, a great intercessory miracle, a blessing, a grace, as a result of praying to these uh, new friends, new saints, uh, you can uh, you can contact the causes as well. So hopefully that leads to a few new American saints. Oh, that's really awesome. I, it also makes me think of the practice in a lot of religious orders where they would choose a saint for the year to walk with and to learn from. And it might be a nice thing for our kids. We think of, of our their confirmation saints, certainly, or their name saints, their baptismal names. But if they found someone in this book that they really liked and they thought, I can help this person along with my prayers, possibly to being canonized, to being formally recognized while learning from this person. I can say every day, okay, um, is it Venerable Patrick Payton or is he? That's right. That's right. He's Venerable. Yep. Patrick, and I they can do, say. They do have a miracle yeah. under consideration right now. So perhaps we'll see in uh, in short order here, we'll see him become a blessed. That's what we're all, we're all praying for them, that one. Oh, how wonderful. So we can ask them to walk with us and teach us, and, and he, we can even be of help to them just as we can with the holy souls. Any other thoughts on how we can use these in our homeschools? Well, again, I think that the uh, the the television show airing on Fridays at 5 p.m. will be a great way to uh, to visualize these saints. But uh, we can go uh, chapter by chapter and learn about the saints, and then. Uh, I find that I find the chapters on the saints' lives the most interesting, but I also dedicate chapters to how the sainthood process works and the search for miracles, how that all works. So uh, it's a little bit more technical and process oriented. So maybe you have to have a, a certain way of thinking to really enjoy those the same way. But uh, I think people always want to know, how does that happen anyway? How does the Pope get the idea? It's not somebody whispers in his ear and he just canonizes somebody. It's it's decades and years, uh, sometimes centuries of of looking at a potential saint that, uh, that the church does. So I try to shed some light on that uh, sort of a mystifying process uh, in, in the early chapters of the book as well. Yeah, and I feel like God has his own sense of the right time for a particular saint to be highlighted, I would think, in the world too. So sometimes as with Fulton Sheen, we've seen there have been stumbling blocks and they've been cultural and they've been about timing. And well, we just have to trust God that, that sometimes things are delayed or or even suppressed, like the, the miraculous medal or the divine mercy, with that, so many things that have been so valuable in our own times uh, had to wait. That's right. God elevates certain saints for certain times, like you say. So uh, there, there's meaning in all of it, for sure. 
Yeah, praise be to God. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Um, I had technical trouble the last time we tried to meet, um, so you've been very patient with me. Thank you so much for making the time today. I know you're super busy. Everybody, find Michael O'Neill at MiracleHunter.com and his new book at TheyMightBeSaints.com. The ordering link is in the show notes, as well as the days and times for his television and radio programs. Thank you again so much, Michael. Thank you, Liz. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. And everybody, thank you for being with us. Don't go away. We have our short feature coming right up. Hi, I'm Dave Palmer, a professor at Homeschool Connections, and I hope you're enjoying this journey through the Summa Theologia as we continue today. And uh, we're about halfway through the Summa with these little segments that I've been doing, so hopefully you are enjoying learning from the Angelic Doctor. And today we are going to continue talking about human nature, which was basically the last video was on man's last end, in which we are destined to be united with God. And today in particular, we're going to talk about the virtues and what role they play in us achieving our final end, which is union with God, beatitude, heaven, most people like to call it. Whatever you call it, that is what we are directed to. And so in this video, we're going to talk about the role that the virtues play. And there are a lot of different kinds of virtues, but I'll try to explain what each of them is and how they differ. And when you talk about virtues, if you want a pretty simple, you know, easy definition, they're basically just good habits. We get into habits, and the habits help us reach our final end. And so this is a diagram of the Summa, which I like a lot. If you look at if you look at it at like a clock, at 10 o'clock there, you have God. Okay, God is eternal. God is infinite. He always has been. And then he creates a world, which is imperfect because of man and sin, right? And then he calls us back to himself, okay? So our life is a calling back to unite with God through Christ in the sacraments. And then the end of the Summa, you know, the end and how, you know, what heaven is like. But one of the key roles during our lives is to acquire or respond to infused virtues. And so what is a virtue? It's, like I said, it's a good habit. Okay, we're very familiar with habits. You may have bad habit like biting your nails or eating too much or smoking or too much time on the device. Procrastination is a very common habit that people get into. And of course, there's good habits as well. You might be studious or you might wake up every morning on time and exercise and you've gotten into a habit of doing that. It's habitual means you don't have to really think about it per se. So the kinds of virtues, first of all, I'm just going to read this red part hat here. Um, a man is perfected by virtue for those actions whereby he is directed to happiness. Okay, that's the key to virtue is it helps us to be happy, both here on earth and eternally as well. Now, man's happiness is twofold. One is proportionate to human nature, a happiness to it, which man can obtain by means of his natural principles. Okay, what can we acquire? What can we kind of do on our own without direct intervention by God? And one of the um, the kind of acquired virtues, or of course, any of these can be infused. God can infuse whatever he wants. But generally speaking, the intellectual virtues are are what perfect our intellect for understanding and coming to know God ultimately. And so some of the intellectual virtues would be, well, prudence, which is also a cardinal virtue, wisdom and understanding and knowledge, science, interestingly, is an intellectual virtue, as is art. Okay, so the things that we make can have virtue attached to them as well. There are four cardinal virtues. I mentioned prudence. These are something that I think everybody should commit to memory. You have prudence, you have justice, fortitude, and temperance. Okay, those are the four cardinal virtues. Cardinal just means they're like kind of hinge virtues, which means all the other virtues under them uh, kind of are related to those four virtues in one way or another. Thomas asks in the Summa, are all the moral virtues about the passions? Okay controlling our sexual appetite or our food or, you know, our, our, our anger in, in, in case of one of these pictures here. He says, no, uh, justice is not about the passions. It's more related to the will that rather than the concupiscence or something like that. All right. Do moral virtues observe the mean? Yes. Thomas actually took this from Aristotle, where let's just say, for example, uh, spending. Somebody may 
uh, have a habit of spending and they spend the right amount of money. But on the on one extreme, there may they may be a spendthrift. They're spending too much. But on the other extreme, I, mean, I don't know if you've heard of this lady in the bottom right here, Hetty Green. The world, the Guinness Book of World Records says she's the greatest miser of all times. Very very rich, but wouldn't spend anything. Okay, so that would be an extreme of not spending enough and maybe spending too much. But right in the middle is um, you know just spending the right amount, and that would be observing the mean. Theological virtues represented by these pictures would be faith, hope, and charity. And the unique things about the theological virtues is that they're always infused. Okay, Like I said, all the virtues could be infused, but theological virtues are not acquired. They are infused. And uh, also, they, the object is God himself. Okay, the, the object is not earthly happiness. The object is directly God himself, and that makes them unique. Okay, so this red part here talks about the difference between the theological and the other virtues. The other, the theological virtue, is a happiness surpassing man's nature and which man can obtain by the power of God alone, by a different kind of participation of the Godhead, about which is written in Second Peter that by Christ we are made partakers of the divine nature. Okay, this unites us to God directly. And because such happiness surpasses the capacity of human nature, man's natural principles, which enable him to act well according to his capacity, do not suffice to direct man to his same happiness. Hence, it is necessary for man to receive from God some additional principles whereby he may be directed to supernatural happiness, even as he is directed to his co-natural end uh, by means of his natural principles, albeit not without divine assistance. Such like principles are called theological virtues, first because their object is God, as I mentioned, in as much as they direct us aright to God. Secondly, because they are infused in us by God alone. Thirdly, because these virtues are not made known to us save by divine revelation contained in holy writ, which is uh, basically holy scripture. All right, so the most important virtues, the highest uh, in the hierarchy are the theological virtues, and then you have also the intellectual virtues, the cardinal virtues, the moral virtues, a lot of different kinds, but the end of all of them is to help us be happy both here on earth, but ultimately in heaven. Don't mistake them for the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fortitude, uh, fear of the Lord, and piety. These are also supernatural. They are infused and they are not acquired. They're gifts which generally are received through the sacraments like confirmation, right? Mm -hmm. All right, that does it. I hope you enjoyed learning about the virtues and how they are related to the Christian life and ultimately are reaching our final end, which is union with God in heaven. God bless you. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.